Throughout the decade of the 1920s, there were many beer and alcohol wars between the rival gangs during Prohibition. Uh, basically, there were several gangs throughout the decade. A lot of them ended up, and a lot of the men in charge of these gangs ended up eliminating each other throughout the decade, not needing the federal authorities to do it. They all did it to themselves. It all kind of comes to a head Valentine's morning in 1929. At that point, you basically have Al Capone running the south side of the city. His territory was anything south of the Chicago River. This side of town was run by Bugs Moran. Uh, that was a, a gang initially started by four childhood best friends, a man named Dino Banyan. By the time you get to the late 1920s, there's only one of those four childhood best friends left alive, and that is Bugs Moran. Um, Valentine's morning in 1929. Now, everybody believes Al Capone was responsible for ordering the hit on the seven men in this garage that would have been back here behind me that day. But there was no direct evidence to charge him. He was actually not even in Chicago that morning. He was at his winter estate down in Miami. But allegedly, Capone learns that the Northside gang's supposed to have a meeting in this garage about 10.30 that morning. They're supposed to get a shipment of whiskey coming from Canada. So he sends, again allegedly, at least four men to raid this meeting. Two of these men come dressed as Chicago police officers, and they come in a Chicago police car. The other two men were wearing regular civilian clothing. That police car would have pulled up right in front of the garage on the street here. The two men dressed as police officers go through the front door. The other guys go around back coming through the alley in the back door. Now you have seven men in that garage that morning. Six that we know for sure were in some ways affiliated with the Northside Bugs Moran gang. The seventh man was a 29-year-old optometrist who by most accounts was not a gangster, but he just loved hanging out with gangsters. He just loved the company of gangsters. And kind of uh, that was his downfall that day, he paid the price with his life. Now the men probably think this is just a routine liquor raid, something they've been through before. As the guys dressed as police officers storm into that garage, they lined them up against the, the north wall. Uh, with their backs to them, they take out the Tommy guns, the machine guns, and they just blow those men to pieces. Now, this is a very cleverly executed plan, and probably why it is still an unsolved mystery to this day. Because these men in this garage were not found for about three hours after that shooting. Now, you would think these machine guns make a lot of noise, which they do. And people in the neighborhood would have heard all this noise, which they did. But to make it look to people in the neighborhood who heard all this gunfire, that the police are there and have the whole situation under control. The men dressed as police officers handcuffed the other two men at gunpoint. They walked them out the front door of the garage, threw them in the back seat of that police car with the lights and sirens on. That police car drives off. So everybody thought, that's it, all over. Nothing more to see here. They find those men three hours later only because of a dog. The uh, mechanic for the gang and former safe cracker John May had brought his German shepherd named Highball to the garage that morning. Now Highball was not harmed at all, tied to a truck toward the back of the garage. But the lady who lives in the apartment building back there hears the dog barking, wonders why nobody's comforting this poor dog. She gets a neighbor of hers, afraid to go in the garage by herself. The two of them come in the garage together. I mean, you could imagine the horror that they see when they open the door to that garage. The man actually runs out screaming that there are dead people everywhere in here. It would have been the back end of the north wall, so somewhere around where that car is, that's where they would have been shot. Now, the garage itself does stay up here till about the year 1967. City takes down all these gangster sites, not wanting to be known for these kind of things. But when it comes down, they say that bricks from this site became like collector's items. People were paying big bucks for these bricks, uh, especially if they had blood on it or bullet holes in them. But then a lot of stories started coming out that people were experiencing weird things who had these bricks. Um, some were being haunted, some were getting in like terrible accidents or getting horrific diseases. So people started to think the bricks were cursed. Eventually, the bricks ended up being bought by a man who wanted to reassemble the wall where the guys were shot in a gangster-themed bar and restaurant that he was opening in downtown Vancouver, British Columbia, which he does. He calls the place the Banjo Palace, uh, reassembles the wall in the men's bathroom of that bar. Does let the ladies in to see it, so, you know, don't worry. 
He actually, he actually put up plexiglass in front of the bullet holes, and the men were supposed to aim their pee toward the bullet holes and hit the plexiglass. True story. <laughs> but the bar doesn't last too long. Uh, you can still see the bricks today, but in order to do that, you have to go out to Las Vegas because the uh, wall is reassembled in the Mobster Museum in Vegas. And there are stories of the bricks being haunted, similar to this site here. In the museum there, they report hearing the sound of gunshots, also reported here. They also hear the sound of men moaning and falling to the ground. Again, something reported here. They say dogs tend to react going by this site, possibly picking up on the energy of the dog. The owner of this building, who I've met on several occasions, he's owned it for like 40 years, he says there's a lot of poltergeist activity that takes place in the building. Things flying off of counters and falling off of shelves. Many believe there is still a very heavy psychic imprint over this land. Seven men were brutally gunned down here. And it's still an unavenged murder, unsolved mystery. That would be a breeding ground for something like that. This side here, you have a senior citizen's home. This is their property. Even though Lincoln Park, prime real estate right back here behind me, probably over a million dollars to build something on this land, the city says that nothing will ever go on this land again. It's only gonna be what you see back here.